Hello. Today we're continuing with our GCSE Physics Revision series looking at analog and digital signals. I shall probably cover a little more than you need for GCSE, but I shan't be covering the topic comprehensively. If you want to know more, I do have another video which is called Digital Sampling and Signal Spectra and Bandwidth, which you'll find in the A-Level Physics Revision series and playlist, which covers everything I'm going to tell you and a lot more besides. The issue we're dealing with here is conveying information and transmitting them or storing them in some kind of signal. And the question is, do you use analog or do you use digital? So we really need to know the difference. The example I'm going to use is sound recording. So here is a microphone. And here am I speaking into the microphone. Um, now we don't need to know too much detail about how it works, but in principle what is happening is that when I speak, I am emitting sound waves. Sound waves, as we have learnt, are longitudinal waves. They cause the air to vibrate backwards and forwards. And those vibrations go into the microphone where there is what's called a diaphragm. It's, I suppose you could think of it as a stretched piece of balloon skin. And as the air waves vibrate, they cause the balloon skin to vibrate. Only marginally, but they do cause it to vibrate. Usually, it depends how you organize your microphone, but usually on the uh, piece of balloon skin, there's a little magnet. And around that magnet will be a coil of wire. So you've got a vibrating magnet in a coil of wire. And we know from electromagnetic induction what happens when a magnet moves in a coil of wire. It causes a current to flow in the coil. It's called an induced current. We've covered all of that. So from the microphone, there will be a current flowing. And that current will be determined by the extent to which your sound waves have been converted into that current. And if you've ever seen um, the a recording um, of a voice on, say, an oscilloscope, you get lots of squiggles, which represent the different frequencies of the sound that I am using. And basically what you're measuring on the oscilloscope is time in this direction. This is as time goes by, you get all these squiggles and usually voltage um, up in the y direction because if there's current there's obviously a voltage so you're typically measuring the voltage of the electric current that you're getting as time goes by and that voltage or that pattern is an analogous pattern to the sound that caused it that's why we call it an analog signal it is the electrical analog of the sound that created it. So what do we normally do with that uh, signal? So here's my microphone and that produces my uh, uh, signal um, and then you might convey that to a loudspeaker so that the sound comes out. Or you might convey it to um, you know some sort of recording device. In the old days it was an old tape recorder reel to reel where you stored this electrical signal on magnetic tape and then you could reproduce it and send it to the speaker. Or of course in essence you might want to tr transmit it in the form of a telephone call. So it goes over wires and eventually gets to somebody else's um, house and they listen in on the telephone. So you are transmitting this analog signal in a variety of ways, sometimes you're storing the signal, sometimes you're sending it over short distance, sometimes you're sending it over long distance. And what happens when you send that analog signal over these wires? In some ways it gets distorted. You lose some of the detail. Or in some cases additional detail gets added. And that's called noise. It shouldn't be there. It's not the true high fidelity, high truthful reflection of what you created. So when you, particularly when you store analog signals on a, some kind of tape recorder, you find that you lose quality. And the reason you lose quality is that the precise detail of this analog signal is in some way changed, and that introduces noise. So what can you do about that? 
Well, let's just draw the um, analog signal in a fairly simple way. Obviously, it's a much more complicated than this, but this will just give you the idea. So, you know, th this is a sort of a small section of the analog signal. Remember, this is the time. So these, this frequency is, or the, rather this voltage, because this is voltage up here. This voltage is varying as time goes by. Now, what you could do is you could put a grid over this. Which divides the signal up into little squares. And you'll see that along the x-axis, you've essentially got lots of little time intervals because this is time along here. So this is, these are little time intervals. And along the y-axis, you've essentially got lots of little voltage intervals. And then what you can do is you can say, what is the main voltage in each time interval? So you'd say, well, let's say this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So you'd say, well, the voltage in this first time interval is four volts. So we'll call that four. The voltage in this time interval is two volts. The voltage in this time interval is five volts. The voltage in this time interval is approximately on average three. Here it's about one, here it's about three, here it's about five, here it's about two, here it's, well, on average, it's, it, you're only allowed whole numbers, two. So you're not allowed any kind of 3.1s or 4.2s or whatever. You have to say, what is the average value of the voltage in each of these time intervals? And so you get that this complicated thing here is simply a set of numbers. 4, 2, 5, 3, 1, 3, 5, 2, 2. Now the point about that is you can store those numbers in a computer and they cannot now be corrupted. You know, a computer can't misread a 2 for a 3. Maybe the whole file can be corrupted and lost, but you won't get any noise added to this anymore because these numbers are now integer numbers. If it's a 4, it's a 4. It can't be anything other than a 4. And you can store that or you can send it over the airwaves in some encoded signal, nothing will ever corrupt those numbers. You can reproduce the digitized, and this is now called a digital signal. You can now reproduce this anytime you like without any distortion of the signal. But of course, what you will recreate will be a signal that looks like this. Four, two, five, three, two, one, sorry, that should have been three, three, five, two, two. And that doesn't look like that. So actually, you could say you have distorted the signal by digitizing it because this looks nothing like this. And that, of course, is perfectly true. But it's only true, really, because of the size of the grid that I happen to use. This is a very clumsy grid because it requires huge dis distinctions in voltage to be encapsulated in one average. Suppose I were to take the frequency distribution, which you know, looks, of course, something like this. It's usually a lot more scribbly than uh, the one I drew. And suppose I were to have a grid which had 65,536 gradations along the voltage scale, 65,000. And suppose I had 44,100 gradations per second along the time scale. In other words, I measure the frequency, sorry, I measure the voltage um, 44,100 times every second. And each time I measure that voltage, it can be given an integer number between zero and 65,536. I think you'll agree then that you will get a digitized signal that will be almost identical to the analog signal that created it, because we've got enough intervals that you lose hardly any of the detail. Why do we choose such a curious number as 65,536? Well, because that number can be stored 
in two bytes of a computer's memory. You can store any number from zero to 65,536 in two bytes. So in other words, every single division that you measure the voltage requires two bytes of computer store. You are doing that 44,100 times per second, so you will need 44,100 times two bytes for every second of sound that you are digitizing. And that, of course, is approximately 88 kilobytes of computer space, because you need 44,100 uh, divisions or measurements, each of which requires two bytes. So that's about 88,000 or 88 kilobytes of computer space. So now imagine that you're recording a three minute song, which of course is 180 seconds. So how much space are you going to need for all that information? Remember, you're, you're taking a measurement of the voltage 44,100 times a second, and each of those voltages can be given an integer value between naught and 65,536, and that number requires two bytes. So, we've got 180 seconds. For each second, you are going to do it 44,100 times. So that's the number of measurements you're going to make. Each measurement will, leave, will yield a digitized number which can be stored in two bytes of memory. So that is the total amount of memory that you're going to need to store a three minute song. And that comes to approximately 16 megabytes, 16 million bytes. And of course, typically we now record in stereo. So you're going to have two channels. So if you multiply all of that by two, you get 32 megabytes. So typically, a three minute song recorded in the way I've described will, when it is digitized, occupy 32 megabytes of computer memory. So on a compact disc, when a song is stored, it has of the order of 32 megabytes occupying in that compact disc. What, of course, some people have been able to do is to find a mechanism to reduce the amount of space needed. And those of you who've got MP3 players will know that a three minute song is approximately three megabytes. Now, I'm not going to describe how they do that. It's simply to say that there are mechanisms whereby you can take a 32 megabyte song and compress it in such a way that you can get the overall file size down to three megabytes without appreciably losing any quality. But that's a compression technique. If you do it in the straight way that we've described, a three minute song recorded in stereo, digitized, takes 32 megabytes of either computer space, if you store it on a computer, or space on a compact disc. So the advantage of digital over analog is that analog, the, uh, the little bits of information can be corrupted. They, you lose some of the detail and that means you lose quality. Once you've digitized it, those digital values cannot be changed. They're in the computer for all time. They can be stored, they can be transmitted, they are never corrupted. That doesn't mean to say we can do away with analog altogether, after all, if you are recording a voice with a microphone, you are bound to get an analog signal because the uh, voltage that you get out is analogous to the sound that went in. But very quickly, you put that through a digitizer, this grid that digitizes that signal. So you give it as little time as possible to become corrupted. And now you can do what you like with that signal because it's digitized, you can store it, you can transmit it, you can do what you like with it. But at some point, you're gonna to have to put it through another box which converts it back into the analog signal that it was in order, for example, to send it to a speaker, either a loudspeaker, so you play music, or maybe the speaker in your telephone so you can hear what's going on. But the key point about this is that for the bulk of the storage or transmission, you're using digital where there will be no distortion. 
and it's only at the very beginning and the very end of the system that you need an analogue signal. Sometimes some musical instruments, some digital musical instruments like keyboards, will actually generate a digital signal, so you don't ever get an analogue signal at the beginning of the process. But generally, if you want to create sound, at some point you have to create an analogue signal to be fed through to a speaker. I said that when you were recording music, it's typical to record the voltage of that analogue um, spectrum 44,100 times per second. If you're making a telephone call, it really isn't necessary to go to that amount of detail because now we're just usually talking about the spoken voice and quality isn't uh, hugely important. So telephone companies tend to record the voltage about 8,000 times per second. So it's significantly uh, less quality than for music, but it's perfectly service serviceable and it's perfectly all right. And so what the telephone company does is it digitizes your voice and then it sends that digital signal down the cable. So here's your digital signal being sent down the cable to somebody at the other end. But it can what's called multiplex. It can put in other people's conversations all in little packages. Now it doesn't mean that when it gets to the other end it will all be interspersed. You don't hear everybody else's conversation because when it gets to the other end each of these packages has been coded in such a way that the system knows which bits are your conversation. So it filters out the bits that are yours and that's what gets sent to the person you're talking to on the telephone. But this way one cable can carry many people's conversations because the digital information which is being sent down the line is being sent in little packages and you can slot several of those packages into the cable. Uh, it really depends on what the total bit rate is um, of that cable. The total amount of information you can transmit per second determines how many different conversations you can carry down that cable. So that's called multiplexing and it enables many conversations to go down the same cable but to be then separated out when it gets to the end so that you each only hear the conversation that you're a part of.